1930s, in the middle of the Thirty Years' War, as well as having an ice age, a mini ice age. And even the trees were named in Germany. There's no free wood. I mean, Virginia's going to tell us all about it. Dr. Virginia DeMars? Okay, this is, uh, I, you, I made space. Uh, trying to do anything when I'm sitting down just frustrates me madly because I need to move around and wave my arms. In Tucson, which was about three years ago, I did a panel on land tenure in early modern Germany. And there was demand for information on land use, which is not at all the same thing. I'm going to start out with a two minute summary of land tenure, which is an explication of why I shrieked when that guy said fiefdoms. <laughs> <laughs> Land tenure in early modern Germany was a buy and sell real estate market within an inherited legal system that involved feudal tenures, which means that land was not held by nobles as a fief from a higher noble or from the emperor in general, although legally it might be. Rather, land was owned, some of it by nobles, some of it by businessmen, some of it by corporations, some of it by city councils, some of it by charitable institutions, uh, some of it by groups of heirs who over three generations had not managed to figure out how to partition what grandpa left them, so are running it as a committee. Uh, and after something like this, so that you might have, for instance, that lovely village near Nuremberg we were talking about, it was a small village, only about 800 people in it, but a third of it was under the authority of the Archbishop of Mainz, Catholic. A third of it was under the authority of the Margrave of Bayreuth, Lutheran. A third of it was under the authority of the city of Nuremberg, although it wasn't within Nuremberg's territory. It just was under Nuremberg, which led to its being the largest Jewish settlement in that part of Franconia because the villagers among themselves had the arrangement that whenever considerations of high politics required one or the other of their authorities to expel the Jews, they would just trade houses with their neighbors across the street who were under the authority of one of the other <laughs> people, and they would continue to live there in undisturbed tranquility. This is Schurt, uh, where Henry Kissinger was born, uh, until they next political upheaval required, say, the Margrave to expel them, in which case, of course, the Catholic authorities would take them in because they were being persecuted by the evil Lutherans. Uh, it was like this. It drives Eric mad. Uh, Eric's deep desire is to simplify early modern Germany so he doesn't have to deal with these peculiarities. And my story in the latest Ring of Fire, Make My Macrame, is basically my statement to him, sorry Eric, but it isn't going to work out that way all the time. But take that principle, that land holding, land tenure, the question of who owns the land is a very mixed bag. It's not a lord up on the hill in a castle with a bunch of oppressed peasants in a village down at the bottom. Which leads us to the fact that 85% of the Germanies had a village-based agricultural system. 
that means, of course, that 15% oddly didn't. Uh, up in areas, uh, parts of Westphalia, for example, you do have American-type farms uh, with uh, the house in the middle of the farm and the area that the farm family uh, cultivates around it. Uh, most of the Germanies, however, almost all of the Germanies, had village-based agriculture, which was cooperative. It was not collective, but it was cooperative. Villages were dotted all over the map. Depending on the fertility of the land, they are closer or further apart. By further apart, I mean it might be five miles from the center of village X to the center of village Y to the center of village Z. But I mean closer, it might be two miles from the center of village X to Y to Z. In an area like Franconia, the villages were much closer together. It's up where you get the thinner population in Brandenburg uh, going over toward the East Elba where they're somewhat further apart. Almost all of Germany west of the Elbe by this period no longer had plantation style agriculture. That is, you did not have the owner of the land employing people to farm the mean holdings. Rather, practically all land was leased by whoever owned it, be it a corporation or a charitable institution or the University of Jena or whatever it might be, to peasants, usually for a term of three lives or 99 years, whichever came first, uh, which meant that uh, the youngest person on a lease tended to be perhaps five or six years old at the time the lease was issued because the family who was doing the agreement wanted to have the lease run <coughs> as long as it possibly could before they had to negotiate a renewal. Uh, there are places where you have shorter leases. Uh, for instance, uh, in the immediate vicinity of a good-sized town like Augsburg or Nuremberg, where the agriculture was heavily directed toward uh, market gardening and dairying to provide the immediate needs of the city, leases <coughs> tended to be on shorter terms because the city council wanted to keep a tighter grip on the leaseholders and be able to redirect the produ produce uh, if uh, if the council itself decided it was in the best interest of the city to have something else produced and coming in. They just wanted to keep their tenants on a fairly short leash as far as what they did. Uh, most villages had a level of subsistence agriculture. That is, you had a village growing garden produce for its own consumption. You had a village, if it could afford it, putting in a carp pond for its own consumption. Uh, because remember, although fish in running water were defined as game and were somebody's hunting right, fish in still water were defined as a crop and were somebody's supper. Uh, so you had an extensive network of carp ponds all over the place. In places you had commercial carp ponds producing fish 
or the uh, city markets. Uh, you had grain, but not all villages grew their own grain. In Thuringia, where uh, Grantville landed, a heavy amount of field cropping was woed for the dye industry. And the villages that mainly grew woad did not try to waste enough of what they regarded as their valuable feed space, field space growing grain to make bread. They bought grain in the market and sold the woad and hopefully made a profit. I'm so yes. sorry to interrupt. I'm not familiar with woad. Can you spell it? W-O-A-D. It's the stuff that turns you blue when you wipe it on your face. And when you mix it with urine, it makes you hallucinate. I always thought that was popsicles. Imagine, <laughs> imagine the Celts uh, greeting <coughs> Caesar. Actually, woad as a plant uh, is yellow flowering. You yeah. wouldn't expect it pr to produce blue dye, but it does. Thanks yeah, for I'm you. Right. Have interrupted here. It was uh, the cheap blue dye. Uh, that was available. Uh, for the darker shades, they imported indigo from uh, the Near East. But Wode provided uh, you know, that blah sort of medium. Uh, blue jean blue? No, uh, more like faded blue jean blue. Or uh, it was a light medium grayish blue. Uh, and uh, it was quite uh, useful. Uh, if you look at if you come back tomorrow for the clothing thing, you'll find a lot of peasants sitting around in taverns wearing narrow-legged blue work pants. They were dyed with woad, made of hemp and dyed of woad, with woad. That preserves was your standard pair of work pants. Preserves the fiber the, and is different from blah. Yeah. The, the shock of the blue jean will not be anywhere near as much as a lot of people wistfully hope, because the narrow-legged blue work pants were narrow leg blue work pants. People wore them. They didn't have pockets, they didn't have rivets, but they had the pants. There are only so many ways to cover the human body. <laughs> Until you hit the dragon point. Mm -hmm. Then there's lots of ways to uncover the human body. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, getting them down, and in Thuringia, in Franconia, in the main place where we're dealing with until our people go traveling around uh, the map, the, the agriculture is village-based. How is a village run? You can't understand land use until you understand land management. Who has the right to say what is done with a village's land? Hmm? The church. Well, no, not the church unless the church owns holds some of the land. Sure. The adult male leaseholders who make up the village council. Uh, the village council in most places has an head official chosen by the villagers who can be called anything of a dozen different names and titles depending on where you are. We usually